hear his real story. Something I have sold more kilograms of heroin and heroin than any other single individual on Sunday. Connect Melvin to people in New York and give Melvin a, a good heroin connection. Tell his true accounts of how he became the king of a heroin empire in Baltimore during the 70s. Some millions of dollars were right off the top. At some point they told him that they wanted me next. And was ultimately framed by those in power. They got a very corrupt police sergeant to put drugs on him. I never thought I was going to jail. And he says, but I don't think you understand the gravity of what's happened to you here today, that there was a warrant being ready to be dropped on me to give you 120 years. That was all manufactured, and it was on the face of an informant. A gold card informant. He was going to be kidnapped as well. They couldn't put an honest charge on him until 1975. That's the truth. But they convicted me and sent me to the penitentiary. I'm a failure as a drug dealer. You will be too. The documentary film by director Derek Thomas that's sure to have everyone talking. Division Pictures presents Melvin Williams' life in the game. This isn't a war against drugs. This is a war against black folks. graduated out of hell, I am delighted to try to share all of the things that I've learned with young folks that look like me. And I, I'm not removing that or reserving that from young folks that look like somebody else, but the mere fact that I have spent 26 and a half years in the federal penitentiaries all around the planet and witnessed at least some 200 murders and I've been blessed to have degrees in four specific arts, Taekwondo, Goju, Shotokan, and Kung Fu, and three and a half years of samurai with a particular instructor. I want to be able to give all of the things that I've learned to young people who are desperately in need of it. Uh, I, some of my discipline is that I've never had a beer, cigarette, aspirin, a joint, a cup of coffee a glass of eggnog, I've never tasted meat, and I eat once a day, and I awaken every morning at 4.30. I don't care what time I lay down, I awaken at 4.30. And those are the kind of things that I'd like to encourage the other guy to do by being the message that you send. Currently, I teach, would you believe, I teach law, constitutional and criminal law, that I learned while I was being attacked by a government that doesn't lose. So that's what I want to share as practically as I can to young people, that if you know more about the law, there's a high likelihood that you might try to bend it, but you'll realize that you can't get away with breaking it. I mean, you don't say so much in your life, and in the world of martial arts, we have so many people that's teaching people how to kill. They teach these deadly arts where you can pay $2,000 and get a kit, and you can become the ultimate fighter, and they guarantee that you're going to be able to stop. In my mind, you're going to be able to stop anybody that comes up in the hood that thinks that they know how to fight. It's not a racial thing, but that's basically what I get when I see it, because most criminals are either dumb, stupid, and they really don't know that. Um, I mean, how would, what does a stereotype like that, I mean, how does that affect you when you... He's a rogue. He's a rogue, and it's so many nowadays and so many young folk that no longer respect the sacredness of the art. The art was taught, as you know, from perspectives of the old folks for self-defense. And before the group that I was blessed to be in the presence of learned the art, we had to spend almost six months learning how to get our body and mind in shape before we ever learned how to begin to throw a punch. And only then were we taught the different things in progression. Like you saw the picture Kung Fu. He was the grasshopper. He learned a first degree move when he was a first degree mind person. He learned second degree moves as he became more involved with the discipline. When he finally learned how to kill somebody, 
he had acquired all the skills to know that it only takes seven pounds of pressure on any particular area of the body to cause murder or to cause mayhem or to break or to kill. That's what I think is the right thing to do. But you're right, there's guys all around the planet that teach these concepts out of a book and it's all commercial. He's He's selling it. He wants, he wants to get his bills paid. And, and what's the consequence of violence? I mean, they, everybody want to promote violence, but what's the, from your viewpoint and your philosophy, what's the real consequence of violence? I don't think most of these guys know this. Well, one of the blessings that I've learned of this photographic memory that I have mm. is that I have, everything I read, I retain. While I was confined, I started reading the Bible. I won't go into the story as to why, but there's so many stories of relativity, and as I read it, I became more convinced that there's a God. And in the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter and the seventh verse, it states, be not deceived, this God will not be mocked. For what you reap, you'll sow. And in the book of Matthews, the 12th chapter, and the 36th verse, it states, for every idle word that you utter, you'll be held accountable for in the day of judgment. For by your word, you'll be justified, or by your word, you'll be condemned. I don't think anybody is gonna get away like we did when we were consumed as drug dealers and we were fascinated with the $100 bill. I think ultimately where you stay, that's where you lay. And a lot of people, we talk about violence, we talk about, um, even from a martial arts standpoint, we talk about, well, I'm gonna show you how to break this person up. I'm gonna show you how to choke this person up. I'm gonna show you how to kill this person. But damn, they forgot the possible incarceration. Ain't nobody showing anybody how to prepare for the possibility to go behind those prison walls. Um, what is the consequences of ending up behind those prison walls? Uh, you, <laughs> you refresh me. You know, I, I've spent long enough in federal penitentiaries that if I had done this when I first went in, I'd be able to fly. And everything that you encounter in a federal penitentiary is ugly and devastating. And you run into all different kinds of people as ornery, as brilliant, as anybody you could name, but they got a kind of mentality that exists in the penitentiary that is separate and aside from every place that I have ever been. It's like a balance. Everything balances off. If you call another man, not male, if you call another man a rat, gay, or anything out of his name, trust and believe, one of y'all gonna die. Maybe not that week, maybe not that year, but because usually both of you have got the kind of sentences that probably are never gonna get out of there, he watches and waits and waits until the day that he got you at your weakest possible opportune moment, and there he comes. With only one thing in mind, I'm gonna kill this guy. So that's, I say to everybody that I come in contact with, there's nothing more priceless than this. And you gotta be the message that you send because if you disrespect another person in the places where I've grown up, again, one of y'all gonna die. And that, that's just so awesome because I, I, I know even in the world of martial arts, and I guess that's the whole purpose of this, you see so many people demanding that you respect them or so many ladies demanding that you respect them, but yet you ain't giving up, they, they not giving the other person respect. For some, some reason, society, is spoke, it's like it's a one-sided thing. And I, I guess when you find yourself, you realize that you're gonna be the example of respect, but you got kids, it's like, excuse me for my language, fuck him, he ain't respecting me, so I ain't gonna respect him. I mean, what can we do? Because, I mean, your wisdom and your experience in life, what can we tell or, or suggest to someone to represent what you talk about, respect? Well. From the street and from a confinement standpoint, I guess I'm around with no scars and bullet holes for a whole host of reasons, 
God first, because for some reason, I believe that he's allowed me to go through this hell so that I can stop some folks from going and I can show the other ones how to get out, because hell is where I've been for a considerable period of time. Again, I've witnessed 200 murders up close. A third of them, at least, I think I could have stopped. But I was the same thing that most of these kids are. I was angry. Until you learn how to control and manage your anger, you are going to self-destruct. You don't have to have nobody else to destroy. You're going to self-destruct. So again, it came a time when I had learned anger management. Only because I woke up one morning in a penitentiary called Terra Hut, the gladiator school of the federal system, and the anger was gone. I was no longer angry. And as I turned around and remembered that I had been in Atlanta for five years, two months, 11 days, eight hours, and 15 minutes from 74 to 79, that I had been in Lewisburg, and I had been through all of these different other penitentiaries, and I spun around and I tried to remember all of the people that I had been incarcerated with. And the complexion kept coming up black. I said, this is not a war against drugs or crime. This is a subliminal war against black folks. And it's my responsibility as an elder to teach these people their history, the law, and the Constitution that they don't fit in. When you hear the statement, we, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain to establish this Constitution to the United States of America. That came from a group of white males, no harm or no prejudice intended, that owned slaves. There came a statement from one of them named Patrick Henry who said, give me liberty or give me death. At the time, he owned 68 slaves. Now, 70 years later, in a case where a slave had gone across the state line and came back and was captured, a guy by the name of Sanford captured him. He filed a case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court Justice Robert Taney, the same judge that inaugurated Abraham Lincoln, ruled this. Mr. Sanford, excuse me, Mr. Scott, you are not a citizen. You are a foreigner. You came here in chains. You have no rights that whites are bound to respect. And so forth and so on. You are three-fifths of a human being. I maintain this day that there is no Jewish child on the planet that last week didn't learn something about the Holocaust and how dreadful Adolf Hitler was to his, his predecessor. We don't teach each other enough about our history, and many more than six million of us died coming to this part of the world. And I contend that slavery, as egregious as it was, wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to us as a people. The worst thing that ever happened to us was the law that they put in place while we were slaves. Law that continue to evolve today that allows police to jump out and tell you, you need to get out of your own neighborhood. Keep moving, keep walking. But we are not together. That's what I want to make blacks understand, that we didn't do it like y'all doing it. We didn't have drive-bys, and we didn't identify with red, blue, and green. When a guy was found dead back in the day, he had powder burns all over him which meant that they shot him up close, specifically and directly. He probably was a roach and needed to die. But that drive by and can hit Melvina, my daughter, or Melody, my daughter, or the old lady, Miss Agnes, that makes all the pies and sews all of the dresses. See, we didn't tolerate that, and it shouldn't be tolerated today.